Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Frank Sirwin from Data Mastery. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is my career in data a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there, and to talk with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Frank Sterwin, the Managing Principal at Data Mastery. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest. But in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Frank, hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Good to join you. I'm so excited. Thanks. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. We've known each other for quite a while. Initially, I think we met at one of our Enterprise Data World conferences Mm -hmm. many, many moons ago. Not too many because then that would make us older, but which we're not. Um, (laughs) But uh, speak for yourself. But so tell me, okay, so you're the managing principal at Data Mastery. So what type of business is Data Mastery? What is it you do? Well, we provide uh, consultative uh, advice and education in the area of master data, uh, specifically around customer, product, service, employee, asset, basically all the main subject areas of master data. Very hot thing right now, master data management. Yes, it has been. It's been <laughs> it's been a, been a good career with uh, just basically you specializing in that area. I love it. So so tell me what um so what is it you do? You so you're the the managing principal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're the primary consultant, right, of the company that right? The and, only and the, the only founder. Yeah, primary and only. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what's your typical week work like? What's a or when you're engaging with clients? Well, I mean, typically uh, it involves all all sorts of data management disciplines. I mean, it's it's our data governance, data quality, data security, um, architecture, database management. I mean, basically, it kind of when you're managing master data, it basically means that you got to bring in all these disciplines because if you don't, you're not really managing master data. So you know, yeah. So it's kind of funny when when sometimes I'll hear people say, "Well, I'm I'm doing master data management, uh, but I'm going to work on data governance next." It's like, well, you, you really aren't managing it if if you're not doing governance as part of it, right? So tell me, um, for listeners out there who may not know, what is master data management? What is master data? Well, mas- master data are your your basically your key subject areas. It's it's what I describe as the who, what, and where that's in any transaction, uh, communication, or event. So that seems to basically ring true with a lot of business users when you say the who, what, and where. Um, Because when I hear things like, oh, it's the the key subjects, it's the core entities, business people don't talk like that, right? So, you know, and then then next thing you know, they have to give examples, you know, because, Mm -hmm. because it's like, well, what does that mean, right? So if you say who, what, and where, I think it's pretty it's pretty clear. I mean it's it's about the who being, you know, a person or an organization, the the what being a product or service, the where being a location. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's very clear. So let's back it up a little bit, Frank. I know some of your journey, but not all of it. Certainly, um, you know, tell me when you were very young, you know, say six years old, um, you know, was this the dream? I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be a consultant in special who specializes in master data management. It definitely wasn't at six. <laughs> I mean, well, what's the dream? I, I think <laughs> I think as old as I am, they were still using abacuses back in those days. So was, we weren't talking about master data yet. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but it was interesting. I mean, it, it, probably in high school, early on, 
I wanted to be a photographer. Oh, and, mm -hmm. and actually, that was my very first job, actually, mm -hmm. in high school, is I was a photographer for the for the village, for the town that I lived in. And I was doing all their public relations photography for the local newspapers. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, I was also the, the photographer for the, for the uh, school paper. So I had my own dark room at home. So, you know, I would do my own processing, oh. too. So yeah. I really was into that. And I thought, well, maybe I'd go into that as a career. But uh, then as later, you know, over the years and too, I uh, you was know, still over the years. I mean, I was still like a sophomore, junior in high school. I was selling cameras. And oh. the manager of the department I worked in was a retired professional photographer who mm -hmm. convinced me that the type of photography I do around nature and that sort of thing really is a tough business to be in. And so he introduced me to the term starving artist, you know, so it's, and that's what I decided I really needed to find something else, keep it as a hobby. Hmm. So, so tell me then, where did you progress to? Where did you move on to from there? So senior year in high school, um, it was in a math class, a calculus class, and we were starting to work with computers. I mean, this is, you're talking early seventies. Yeah. So, you know, the way we would program the computers do remote job entry was actually punched holes in a paper tape, not a punch card, a tape. This was a long ribbon of tape with mm -hmm. holes in it that had the instructions encoded in those holes, right? And then they fed it through a remote job entry station into, uh, to a computer over at the local college, you know, to do any kind of processing. And that's how we started. So I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. I'd like to do that. And uh, my, my senior uh, year math teacher said, tried to dissuade me, said, well, you know, you're not real good at calculus. Maybe you should think of something else. I'm like, no, this is what I want to do. So fortunately, I didn't listen to him. And, uh, wow. and actually, two days after I graduated high school, I started college. I'm a workaholic just by my very nature. So I didn't wow. take a break. Everybody, all my friends thought I was nuts, but went yeah. to my first data processing class, as we called it back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and so, you know, did that. And basically, when I graduated college, um, I was able to program in eight mainframe languages. I knew how to I knew how to run a mainframe. I actually knew all the council commands. I knew how to read the, the, the lights on the panels, you know, so and actually I, that came in handy later, actually, as a consultant. <laughs> Oddly enough, one time I was at a, at a at a consulting doing a consulting gig and the operator didn't show up to work that day. And the director asked if anybody knew how to run a mainframe. I said, sure, I do. So he said, well, here, go ahead, run it. So, <laughs> so wow. But, but yeah, so you know, so I graduated from college with uh, the knowledge of, you know, eight languages. And and there are there are that mean at least that many with mainframes. So that was, you know, your your typical COBOL, assembler, PL1, Fortran, RPG, and then some more obscure ones like GPSS, uh, SAS. CICS, so basically covered covered the uh, most of the main languages uh, at the time. Well, but yeah, then, I definitely. Then, yeah. And then two days after I graduated college, I started my first job. Again, I'm a workaholic. <laughs> so, um, what was that first job? It was working for county government. So mm -hmm. it was it was interesting because it was the lowest paying job I was offered, but I knew I could get a lot of experience quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so here, you know, first day on the job, you know, we had a very small staff, and my boss says, you know, Frank, uh, the, the 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 18th Judicial Circuit Court needs something. Go figure out what they need. Go get the requirements, uh, design it, build it, support it. Good luck. And off I went. You know, yeah. So, you know, I didn't I didn't need a lot of uh, you know hand holding, fortunately, because that's the type of job you really couldn't get if, even if we wanted it. Because, um, like I said, there were only there were only four of us that were the programmers, and we were working on multiple systems at one time. So, so I worked with the the court. Actually, I, I designed and wrote the jury selection system um, oh. for for the county. Uh, worked with law enforcement. Worked with the prosecutors. So it was interesting work. I mean, definitely. But uh, just but it was kind of interesting too because in the interview, um, my, this is the first interview here. Was fresh out of college. And they told me, they said, well, you know, if you're really, if you're really good at what you do, you'll probably only last about two years here because most people okay. will jump ship. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. sure enough, I lasted two years <laughs> and I left. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's, then, I, then I went into my first uh, uh, consulting job. And uh, again, pretty much on my own where, you know, worked at uh, a university on their payroll system, 
and then went to a trade union and developed their uh, medical benefits system. And this was all, again, we were just, at that time, we were just going from batch to online processing. And since I was kind of like the CICS guru, as they were calling me, um, you know, I, I was doing a lot of that, you know, getting people to trans transform from, you know, running batch and, and designing batch systems to, to an online system where they were using terminals, you know, for the first time. Um, so, and then, and then they actually sent me out to a steel mill. So I did a computer simulation of a steel mill in Indiana. <laughs> so again, it was a very, well, quite, quite a variety of different, uh, different things that, uh, got involved in there. But then, yeah. then I actually went and said, okay, consulting, I'm done with that. And, and went to go work for Allstate Insurance. And, oh, uh, and, the, and some of what I was doing at Allstate was actually in their telecom group. So this was data and voice communications um, and doing some really, you know, bleeding edge work. Um, and they, they had some, some of the smartest people I've ever known you know, working there. And so we developed one of the first full motion video conferencing systems in the world. There were mm -hmm. only three companies in the world doing full motion video conferencing back, you know, in the, in the day of 19, like 1981. And okay. we had a transponder on a satellite. We had two earth stations, one in Northbrook, Illinois, one in Menlo Park, California, at the Allstate Research Center. And, you know, I would basically design the system and, and it was large equipment, you know, very large equipment, but uh, mm -hmm. fully, fully automated it. And uh, it was full motion, you know, um, compared to a lot of the systems at the time, video conferencing systems were just snapshots. So you'd just see like, you know, little snapshots coming up once in a while. Uh, so that was pretty cool. And I worked on a, uh, a asset management system for uh, network equipment that basically had integrated configuration change and problem management built into it. And actually it became Allstate sold it actually. And it still exists today. It's called NetMan. And there was two of us that actually did the initial, were all the initial work on it. And uh, we also had uh, developed a data visualizations, visualization system which actually this was 1982, <laughs> you know, and we were doing um, graphics on a mainframe, which mm -hmm. a lot of other companies would come to see our network control center and their jaws would just hit the floor because they said like, you know, you can do this on a mainframe, you know? It's like, yeah, well, all you have to do is learn how to program a dumb terminal. And they're going, you can program a dumb terminal? It's like, they're not that dumb. <laughs> so <laughs> you can send commands to a dumb terminal and it'll understand them. So right. it's People didn't know that, but, you know, so it was really, you know, very, very bleeding edge um, type of technology that we were working on. But then my old boss um, from the insurance group kind of called me, would call me every month, try to convince me to come to work for him. Finally, he, he used the right bait, you know, and asked me, you know, well, what are you, what are you looking for? And I said, well, I'm looking to, for management. He goes, well, you know, you're a great programmer. Why would you be, I want to be a manager? I said, well, that's my degrees in management, one of my degrees. And He's like, well, gee, a manager, somebody who knows management and IT. So then he said, sure, you know, I need a manager. So brought me over. And that was part of the financial services group of Allstate, which then um, at the time, Sears, who started Allstate, so Sears owned Allstate Insurance, but Sears also owned Caldwell Banker and Dean Witter. So, which a lot of people like didn't realize that, you know, at the time they, they basically divested themselves of it later. But um, so they decided like, OK, we're going to take all the financial groups of Allstate, which was a large uh, savings and loan in California, 110 branches only in California and are the loan company that Allstate owned and the mortgage company that Allstate owned. And they said, now we're going to move you over to Dean Witter, all internal transfer <laughs> uh, and create this new consumer banking division. And we're going to launch this new thing we're going to call Discover Card. So I was in on the actual creation and launch of Discover Card in 1984. Actually, the first card was issued in 1985. Wow. Yeah. So I worked on a variety of things. My staff, um, we, we programmed the POS terminals that you see sometimes in stores. If somebody wanted, like, like a merchant wanted a, a customized um, logic for it or the, you know, for a gas pump or something like that, we would program that, uh, program the terminals. Um, we did merchant profitability analysis, 
Uh, I worked with ATM networks across the U.S. for cash advance. So basically, it was you know you're just starting from scratch, right? So it's like whatever whatever you need, you know, we we would do it, right? Um, so the, yeah, then uh, then after that, it was a move over to um, first Chicago. It was the first National Bank of Chicago. Um, that was 1988, and um, I was in charge of all of the customer facing channels of the bank. So my my staff, we did teller systems, ATMs, a bank by phone, so the interactive voice response system, um, safe deposit box, uh, uh, web banking, um, interfaces to uh, Quicken and QuickBooks, uh, uh, bill pay, electronic bill pay. That was all my group, all my development and support groups doing that, doing that work. Um, which which is which is where it led to though, which I started to kind of look closely at the data and I'm going, well, you know, this customer data, it really is the same data. And so instead of building these separate systems, maybe I should create this customer hub. And that's where the idea, my idea for a, a customer master data um, solution came from. And that was back in 1989, um, wrote a white paper that uh, suggested some management and uh, management then said, okay, sounds good. Go build it. So we built it. Uh, they did file a patent on it. I'm the actually actually the only one on the patent that was filed, and I worked on the patent itself. So it was it was interesting because when you when you're working on a patent for a design, it's a lot different than just handing over documentation that you would build a system with. It's actually um, very different because of the way it has to be worded legally that somebody couldn't like leave out one step and call it their new invention. So there's certain words and certain terms you have to use, you know. So it, it was very interesting working with the with the patent uh, engineers, the patent lawyers to, to put that together. But uh, yeah, so that that master data, customer master data solution, caught on real big when when uh, when NBD acquired First Chicago, and, and I had an office then in Chicago and Detroit, and they 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 said, well, that sounds great. Put us on this too, add us to this, which did. And then Bank One acquired first Chicago NBD. I then had an office in Columbus, Ohio, and Detroit and Chicago, bounced around between the three cities. Wow. Uh, they they said this was, you know, this was great. Integrate our customers onto this too. So now basically you had the combined bank, the retail side initially, but then commercial side of the bank said, we want to be part of that too. So then we integrated the commercial side of the bank onto it too. So then once, you know, then JP Morgan Chase acquired Bank One in 2005. And so this this solution still exists. I mean, it's it's still out there. Um, not sure if, how much they've changed <laughs> since then, but but yeah, that was my my getting my foot in the door around master data. And I mean, this was years before a lot of these these off the shelf commercial off the shelf systems were even available. I mean, a lot of those companies didn't exist until 1992, 93. You know that the first ones even existed, and here we had an omni-channel, mass, you know, customer master data solution, in you know that was rolled out by 1991, with full integration across all those channels I mentioned, and call center. And, Amazing. And then, yeah, and then they gave me some responsibilities too, uh, for customer analytics. So I also was in charge of that for uh, as part of Bank One. But uh, yeah, then then I moved on and. Uh, and on to uh, something completely different at McDonald's. You know, a different ah. type of company, but they wanted to have a master data solution, solutions as well. So yeah. able to launch, you know, customer master data and product and location master data solutions there. But they also had me in charge of um, database administration, data integration, data architecture, which actually I had some, I had that responsibility even at the bank where, I, it was a, a point in time where I had uh, 80, 85 database administra administrators working for me. <laughs> That's a lot of DBAs. And that was only That's for- a lot, business. yeah. That was only three business lines. That was only treasury services, commercial banking, and worldwide securities. Wow. And five data architects. So I had 90 people as part of that, wow. part of that group. Yeah. But, um, and then at McDonald's, you know, like I said, I had all those responsibilities. And then about six years ago, I decided, you know, I'm coming towards the end of my career. 
uh, I really wanted to do some consulting on my own. And so that's when I decided to strike out on my own. And fortunately, with the network that I built over the years, again, now now I'm approaching 47 years in this business, Shannon. So, wow. <laughs> so that's quite a while. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. And so so it struck out on my own. And with the network I built, actually, I never had to market. I, my clients came to me. So I've been very fortunate. Oh, I can say fortunate, good. but I guess it, it was, you know, just the work I've done in, on all the previous years, the, the previous 41 years, you know, that uh, wow. that they knew me. Yeah. Wow. And I met you when you were working at McDonald's. Yeah. Yeah. Which actually was when I started there in 2010. So it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to my career, it wasn't Fair that long. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So I'm curious. So you decided to go into consulting again after, you know, going away from it earlier. So um, what made you decide that you, that this time was going to be different and it, is it because you had that network? Um, yeah. I mean, that's why I decided to strike out on my own for it. Cause the first time I, I worked for a company, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I was only you know, a couple of years out of college actually. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah. So I like to consult it. I mean, I, it's not for everybody. I mean, mm -hmm. I know some people, you know, like to build that strong relationship with the people they work with and keep that over the years. Well, consulting, you may be there, you know, a few weeks, a few months, maybe a couple of years, and then you're off to something else and you may never see these people again, you know, because sometimes people even ask me, well, did that bother you? And it's like, not really. I mean, I, I like the variety. I guess I was always looking for something new and exciting. Mm -hmm. I had such a passion for this. To me, it was more the work that, you know, versus the people, sure. you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I love that. Um, I love that your first job, um, you took the one that was going to give you the best opportunity versus the biggest salary. I think that's so smart. And I think that so many, you know, in, in myself included, you know, try, you know, look at the, the dollar value first. Um, but that's not strategically necessarily always the right thing to do. So I'm really impressed that you did that the first, you know, out of the gate. Yeah. And I was, quite lucky that the consulting firm I found in, as my second job said, yeah. well, we don't, we don't just apply that, you know, to add 10% to what you made before. Cause they said you you were grossly underpaid. <laughs> I said, glad you realized that. And so rather than 10%, they gave me 50% more. So oh, wow. that was, yeah. yeah. So I yeah. was very fortunate there where it was like, okay, you know, you, you realize I was underpaid and you're going to pay me what I'm worth, not take advantage of the situation right oh so your gamble seriously paid off i love well, it and and the nice yeah. thing too was this particular firm paid time and a half for overtime oh yeah <laughs> yeah you don't see that much anymore you know or at all <laughs> where yeah. time and a half for overtime because what they found was that some of these companies would burn out their consultants because even if they were paying straight time they said okay fine we'll get what we need sooner and if we burn them out, that's not our problem. Once they're gone, it's the, you know, the firm's problem. So this particular mm -hmm. firm said, okay, well, we're going to charge you time and a half, which, which would make you, make, make you think twice. Do you really need it that bad that you'll pay the money? If you want to pay it and the consultant's right. open to it, great, you know, fine. But at least, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it turned out, I mean, on a, on a couple of the, the engagements I was on, I had to work a lot of overtime and, and some of the smaller shops, sometimes testing these online programs, you know, I, I, we had to actually work during off hours. So there was, you know, basically all the business people left and that's when we did our testing, you know, so, and did our coding during the day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it was interesting. Be one where I mentioned the trade union um, uh, work that I did trade union engagement, the actual, IT people that were programmers and operators for this union were actually unionized. So, yeah. So I, I don't know if too many people who know have ever worked with unionized IT, but they were union. But because they weren't carpenters, yeah. this was carpenters union. They yeah. weren't carpenters, so they couldn't be carpenters union employees. But a unionized IT are members of the clerical union. So they're still all part of the ACL, uh, CIU, you know, they, but but they're cleric, but be, they were part of the clerical union, at least at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And because I was Great. actually changing systems from batch to online, and now these these claims processing people, uh, business people were uh, basically, it was kind of changing the, their role, you know, oh, I got to use a terminal now. Actually, yeah. I had to help go into union renegotiations 
for them because now that was changing their job title, their job responsibility. So it's like, okay, not only did I have to write a system, I also had to work with the union and, you know, helping them understand what the new responsibilities were so they could draw up a new contract with these union workers. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was kind of cool. That is cool. Visit dataversity.net and expand your knowledge with thousands of articles and blogs written by industry experts, plus free live and on-demand webinars covering the complete data management spectrum. While you're there, subscribe to the weekly newsletter so you'll never miss a beat. And I love how um, through most of your career, you, you really just, you know, you were an innovator and, and building these really cool things. Um, was it, uh, is it just something that came naturally? Was it curiosity? Is it just, you know, I have this skill that I can make anything happen with this mainframe? Is it, you know, where did, where did that innovation come from? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, having having experience with, you know, eight different mainframe languages when I first got out of school and so I understand conceptually what's possible. Right. Um, I, I, you know, when I when I hear somebody say, well, that that can't be done. And and I asked and to me, what it means to me is, no, you can't do it. Doesn't mean it can't be done. Right. And, and actually, I've had some, you know, very intelligent people tell me it can't be done. And then they said, so what are you going to do? And I go, I'm just going to find somebody who can. And and I usually would go out and be able to find it. Like, you know, I had one time where where I was told by somebody at IBM that it couldn't be done. And and it's like, OK, so then I found a engineer, a former engineer that worked for IBM who designed this particular system. And I said, here's what I want to do. He's like, OK, well, it's never been done, but I think I could pull it off. I said, great, let's do it. You know, so, yeah. So I guess oh. you know I've always been in, you know involved in design. I mean even as a hobby, I do woodworking. I design things and build it. Mm. You know, so I get to me mm. it's like okay, I get to work in the physical world a little bit as well as the virtual world. But you know, sure. but, yeah. But I'll just you know I used to, to take long train rides downtown to downtown Chicago, where you know a one way commute is an hour and a half. But when you're on the yeah. train, you know you could read, you could sit there, and I just would sketch out designs and then I would build it. You know, when I had time. So yeah. Huh, yeah. That's very cool. So Frank, then tell me what has been your biggest lesson so far in your career? Well, I think the main thing that I can kind of pass on is that you have to take responsibility for your own career. You know, don't expect your management to do it. Don't expect your company to do it. Um, and a lot of people I see you do that. You know, I, I mean I had I had staff come up to me and go, well, you must have sent yourself to school for that, and you didn't send me. I go, no, I didn't go to school for that. They go, where'd you learn it? I go, I, I got it out of a book. Well, you didn't buy me the book. I said, I didn't buy, the company didn't buy me the book either. I mean, you know, it's it, like, heck, who paid for your college? You know, I mean, hopefully, you know, it's like you, you took responsibility for your career then and your education, you know? So, hey, folks, you know, to keep, to keep, keep that same mindset and, and continue to learn on your own you know, invest in your own future, right? And and look and think beyond even the technology. Um, I mean, after a while, when I was in management, I wasn't reading technology books anymore. I was re reading psychology books and marketing books because yeah. you're always in marketing. You're always trying to sell something. You're selling an idea. You're selling a new concept, right? You're selling, you're trying to sell management on buying a new tool, but you're selling. And, you know, it, it be, it, so I, I really would advise people to go out and start reading marketing material, reading how to brand something, right? I mean, sometimes, you know, that was like some of the success I had with the Master Data Management Program is I branded the MDM solution. I gave it a name, right? And we yeah. called it Starbase. And everybody, wow, that sounds pretty cool. And then I had shirts made up for the staff where I had these denim shirts mm -hmm. with a logo that, that you know I designed and yeah. suddenly everybody else that wasn't on the team wanted to be part of the team they're gonna like oh yeah you don't like shirts like that you know yeah so, so it really kind of you know gave them uh some kind of identity you know and gave the system mm -hmm. an identity mm -hmm. so it got was, people excited about it yeah yeah and and things that have an identity companies hate to kill it <laughs> that's the thing. It's like, like it's just the MDM system. Okay, yeah, you know, that's easy. We can just say Starbase. Yeah. We're gonna kill Starbase. You know, like, oh no, we can't do that. Yeah. 
Oh, I love that. That's so, that's really good advice. You know, we, we hear a lot, uh, or I've heard a lot in the podcast, you know, to keep learning, you know, it's really as a good lesson, you know, just keep learning, which, which is part of the advice that you gave there. But I, I also love that, you know, take the, um, uh, take charge of your career. Cause it's very true. Yeah. Right. So to, um, not wait for somebody else to, to do it for you. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, and always, and I'd say always look look to the future because a lot of what you're doing now actually mm -hmm. will evolve to the future. I mean, look at where video conferencing went. Look where, where we're on now, right? Now we're doing it right. all. <laughs> but back, you know, back in 1981, I was doing a very large equipment with an yeah. Aquastar projector and, and yeah. oil that had to spread, it had to heat up for 45 minutes and spread across a platen. And it, I mean, <laughs> it worked, you know, but yeah. It, but that was kind of like it, it evolved. That's where the, the future was coming from the past. I mean, artificial oh. intelligence is no different. You know, I hear everybody was, right. and AI is new. I mean, it's the term AI different. was coined in 1956, right? <laughs> right? So, right. you know, it, it, it had a few, what they called AI winters in between, you know, where things slowed down. But sometimes some things just have to come together, like, you know, like, like hardware, like, well, with AI, I mean, what AI really launched AI was the the cloud, number one. So now you had storage, right? You had big data and mm -hmm. you'd be able to store it. And the introduction of the graphical processor unit, now the GPUs that people found that they were invented for gaming machines. But that's what you needed, you know, to to, uh, to do a lot of the, what you needed was, you know, the, the content algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the hardware, you know, mm -hmm. to for this to all come together. Well, speaking of looking into the future, you know, do you, I mean, that's a great segue to just, you know, ask, you know, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Yeah, I think certain jobs will increase, some some will decrease. Um, and I mean, it, it, you know, when you, when you look at, you know, and even I think one of the questions I know that you had on out there was, was data, like what what is data? And it's so hard to define. I mean, I guess because of all of the variety of things I worked on over the course of 47 years, I always had trouble with, you know, like terms like structured data, unstructured data. I said, nothing is unstructured. It's a different structure, but it's not unstructured. So, I mean, I work with audio, right, with interactive voice response back, you know, in the 80s. I worked with, you know, with, with uh, um, the images when I did basically the uh, mainframe data visualization uh, solutions, you know, back in the 80s. And so mm -hmm. I saw the structure, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, I guess I always had an issue with people saying, oh, it's unstructured data. So it's just a big blob. I was like, no, it never was. You know, you just have to look closer. It's different. It's not rows and columns, but right. it's different, you know. Um, so I'd say from that standpoint, if, if people kind of open their minds to that, you know, that data, data is any, anything like that, right? It's, it's text, it's images, it's audio, you know, it's, it's, you know, an attribute with a value too, you know, which is what everybody automatically thinks of data as, you know, and, and to say, look at it and say, okay, there's lots of opportunities there, you know, artificial intelligence, I think is going to take some of that where, where it can do some of the analysis and look for patterns, because it's very good at pattern recognition, uh, which, which is a lot, of, a lot of the analytics I worked on early on was pattern recognition. It's funny when I'm reading a lot now and I, I am going, oh yeah, we did that. Like when I had a when I had to investigate debit card fraud, you know, of, of some individuals, what did I look for? The patterns, you know, to, right, to, find, yeah. to find a culprit, you know, of, right. of pulling it off. So, yeah. you know, and so basically now it's just automated. So like I said, a lot of what you can see going, you know, in the future, you can look at the present and, and kind of extrapolate that and say, this this is where it's going. Forward. Yeah. So I think I think the jobs are will be different. Some of them will change, you know, mm -hmm. because some of them can be automated. But there's going to be a lot of new opportunities, as long as people have the aptitude for that. That's the thing too. It's like it doesn't mean that somebody can easily switch jobs, but you know, build up that aptitude so, so you're ready for it. You know, yeah. It's it, it, that's even you know. I mean, I was in transition one time too, and and you know, and and I've always thought. You kind of, if you had your eyes open, a lot of times you see it coming, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you you kind of have a hunch something's going on, you know, and, and, you know, 
people in a particular location, they don't want you anymore there. They want you, you know, if you're not, you know, back in headquarters, then, hey, then, yeah. So I, I think you just got to keep your eyes open too to, to those opportunities and, and, and to what's going on around you, you know. So it sounds like a lot of the the jobs that you say are, are going to be keep going and growing are are the ones that really uh, innovate how data is used. Yeah, and data quality. I mean, data quality mm -hmm. is a tough one. Is you know, I, I, business. I think business a lot of times thinks, well, the data we have is good enough, mm -hmm. and and that's probably true for the business purpose they're using it for today. You know, right. it might be true. But but not for going forward. Mm -hmm. You know, perfect example you know, that I've given time and time again has been you know when I worked at McDonald's was you know when you, you look at uh, geo coordinates, the latitude and longitudes of a location like a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Well, you go three places to the right of the decimal, and that was good enough for analytics, but not good enough for a smartphone app where it's a restaurant locator for a customer. You know, where it's telling them you've you've now arrived at your destination. And they can't even see the golden arches yet, you know. So you got to go four places to the right of the decimal, you know. So it, you know, so it, so that's the thing too. Is like that that fit for purpose is something that is is um, subjective. And that's mm -hmm. a subjective quality dimension, not as objective, mm -hmm. right? So it's like when when you say, "Oh, I have 100% data quality," maybe for the business functions you're doing now. But right. maybe not the ones for tomorrow. You know, just right. like my example gave. But as soon as they wanted to roll out some new business, you know, initiative like that, the data wasn't good enough. wasn't fit for purpose for that purpose. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. So and so then, Frank, what advice would you give to people looking to get into a career in data management? Hmm. Well, I mean, I I, I personally have found getting a variety of experiences was a huge, huge plus. Um, you know, like I've, I've used them all. I mean, you know, we're, we're you know, we're working with data, you know, managing database administrators, data integration, um, being in information security. Um, you know, those, all those experiences gave me a very holistic perspective mm -hmm. rather than a very narrow, you know, um, myopic perspective of, of this. So, and, and it's, it's funny too, it's like even, I mean, I consider application developers being in data management. Now, a lot of people might disagree with me, but, you know, think about when you're thinking about data quality, for example, you know, where, how, where's a lot of that quality enforced? In edits, where are the edits? In the applications. Who's doing the applications? Developers, right? So how can you say they're not in, they're not a part of data management? You know, and having spent half of my, almost half of my career you know, as a developer or managing developers, you know, I realized that. So I've walked and this thing's working with the development groups because a lot of times in data management, your your um, your roles are kind of put into as a service, like you're servicing applications, right? Mm -hmm. And they come to you for a service. So I'd say learning service management too is is important. So if anybody's interested, like in ITIL, the IT Infrastructure Library certifications, they talk to, they basically address services and how to, you know, what a service is. Um, so that certification helped me. Um, getting a, a, a Six Sigma Green Belt helped me, you know, you know, how many people we work in data quality have that, right? Yeah. But, um, so so that, that kind of thing is where companies saw that, recognize that, you know, knowledge. And by the way, that Six Sigma Greenville, I just went out and got it on my own. I mean, no company paid for it. You know, so so that's yeah. the type of thing is look for those certifications. Um, mm. CCP, you know, perfect perfect example is another one where, mm -hmm. you know, and, and don't just, you know, think, oh, because I got certifications, I'm an expert. I mean, I think you really need to have the, get that experience too, because I've met, I've met a lot of people with certifications as long as they're armed. And, and I've tossed them out of the, <laughs> tossed them out of the company that I brought them into, you know, because they just weren't cutting it. So I, I think you, you really know, need to know how to apply that knowledge. It's not just having the knowledge. If you don't know how to apply it, you know, um, it, it, what good was it, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's oh, so often, it's not until we apply it that we really learn, uh, really can make the, those learnings click, right? I right, mean, right. I, yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, to, and tools kind of same thing is like, you know, you can learn tools, but you got to learn how to use them. I've always said any, any tool could become a weapon in the wrong hands. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, a hammer, a saw, any of those can become a weapon in the wrong hands. Um, so, you know, and, and we used to have a saying back in the day when we had what was called case tools, computer assisted software engineering. We said a fool, a fool with a tool is still a fool. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. So, you know, it's like, you know, so just because you know how to, you know, you know, the tool, right. You know, you need to know how to use it properly. Right. You know, and, and apply it to the right problem, right. To the right mm -hmm. situation. For yeah. sure. Oh, Frank, this has been so lovely to hear your full story. Um, it's really, it's really impressive. Uh, I, ha I have to say, I'm surprised and that uh, of the um, cool things that you've done. I mean, not surprised, but just, uh, gosh, I, I don't know. I mean, I know you have been working MDM, but I didn't realize like you were innovating that. And that's just amazing. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the other, the other thing maybe too, that I might mention, you know, to whoever's listening to is, you know, um, if you really want to understand something well, teach it, right? Mm. Um, and so I got involved in, I was first doing training in CICS. I mean, I was the CICS, you know, online guru back in you know late 70s, early 80s. And, and so I was teaching after work. You know, I was doing two classes a week. And I had, I basically had developed two, two different courses and, and uh, six sessions for, for each course and was teaching that. And, uh, so that helped me understand it better because when somebody asks a question like, well, why, why does it work that way? You know, you start to think, yeah, why, you know I mean? <laughs> yeah. you, you sound like your kid if you go, well, because, you know, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was like, hmm, I wonder why it works there. So, so I would uh -huh. dig into the design manuals of IBM, for example, and figure out, well, why did yeah. they design it that way? You know, yeah. and, and then I came out with a lot of other things that were very useful um, uh -huh. on how to apply it. Yeah, how to do things that people told me was impossible. That was the other thing. It was like that's where I learned what was possible because yeah. I, I knew the I could learn the internals, all right? Mm -hmm. And same thing with you know with the data diversity training, you know, with the data diversity training and the EDW uh, sessions that I you know uh, presented at is it really it makes you think you know about okay why why does it work that way? It puts things in perspective. It kind of you know. Allows you to kind of reflect on you know what you've done and how it needs to be how it was applied and things and and you learn a lot by by putting together courses and, and teaching it and by the way I got over my fear of public speaking that way too so I love a multifaceted approach <laughs> yeah. I, I love that that's that is so great and we are so grateful and very fortunate to have uh, training led by you in our training center so thank you very much so. And I should mention yeah. too that the data diversity tra learning plans that are available, data diversity training learning plans that uh, I've developed. There's you know the one in MDM and actually a second mm -hmm. one coming soon, and mm -hmm. and then the uh, building a career in data management, where basically mm -hmm. I kind of go through even more than what I discussed today, and kind of reflect on my career with some of the little you know hints and tips on on things I've learned along the way. So. Yes, and, and it's great training. And thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, Frank, if mm -hmm. somebody wanted to reach out to you for advice and con uh, consulting, how would they find you? Uh, they can contact me at uh, my my URL for business at frank.serwin at datamasteryinc, it's inc .com. Um, and, and And I'm happy to help. I mean, I, you know, having been for a short time, unfortunately, in transition myself, I learned a lot, including marketing. You know, that's the other thing too, is was that kind of even, even when you're in transition, you're marketing, right? You're marketing yourself, you're mm -hmm. the product. And, uh, and you know, and I met a lot of IT people and I've done, done mentoring, I've kind of paid it forward and and helped a lot of these, these um, networking groups that I was part of have sent IT people my way to help them, you know, look over their resumes, give them, you know, some suggestions. And, you know, a lot, a lot of people say, well, I, I'm in IT. I don't, I don't do marketing. I go, well, the good news is you only have to make one sale. <laughs> so, you know, you you won't have an annual quota because if you have an annual quota, that's a problem I can't help you with. But that's the. 
And and I uh, let me just to clarify, it's F it's F R A N K as in kite, correct. and Serwin C E R W I N. That is correct, right? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Oh well, Frank, it's been such a pleasure and so much fun chatting. Thank you so much for taking the oh, time yeah. to chat with us Welcome. today. This was very enjoyable. Appreciate it. Oh. And to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest podcast and in the latest in data management education, you can go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Thank you.